What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Inside the Razor Crest, episode two. This week, we are reviewing the newest episode of The Mandalorian, better known as The Jedi. Y'all know why I'm so excited for this episode. Because the queen has finally revealed herself. I know you people out there, a lot of you people don't like Ahsoka. Guess what? I could give two Megazords, whether you like her or not. <laughs> and that's just being nice, using clean words. I love Ahsoka. I love everything about Ahsoka. I don't know why I have such a connection to this character. Maybe it's because my foray into Star Wars was the deep watching of both Clone Wars and Rebels. Um, and that's the thing about Star Wars. There are so many doorways to it. There's not just, oh, I, it's all about the movies. Okay, it's the movies. And not just all of the movies, but you have to separate them. You have some people who were introduced to Star Wars with the prequels, like me. Mm -hmm. I, I watched the prequels when they came out. You have some people who are old enough to where their introduction to Star Wars was the first trilogy, four, five, and six. All right. Then you have some people who were introduced in through comic books. Then you have some people who were introduced through novels, actual books. You have people, again, like me, who were introduced to the animated series. And you have people who were introduced to the new prequel. You know, so it's it's so spread out all what's all over the place. And you have have some people who are getting introduced with the new cartoon series, the resistance series, which I just started watching not too long ago. So there's so many doorways to Star Wars. Mine just so happened to be um both in a sense the prequels and you know, more recently the cartoons such as or the animated series such as um Clone Wars and Rebels. But we get Ahsoka Tano, played by Rosario Dawson, which me and Jeremy talked about. There is absolutely no other person in the universe who was designed to play the character, body shape, speech pattern, all that good mm -hmm. stuff, man. It's just, it's just so much. It's just so much that was so great about this episode. And you guys normally know we have Kevin here. Um, but Kevin wasn't able to join us to, on today's recording, but we did get his thoughts on the episode. So I want to play that um, first so we can listen to that and kind of get something to go off on. So here goes Kevin's thoughts on the episode. Well, man, you know, first and foremost, it's always good when you have uh, somebody like Ahsoka show up finally in live action, right? I mean, that's, that's one of the big things and, that we've been waiting to see uh, since we, we first met her in the Clone Wars cartoon and uh, and, and she was a character that had to grow on us because the Star Wars family did not really like that character. So to see her transition from being, you know, a character nobody really liked to mo one of the most beloved new characters of the day for Lonely's Watch is really cool. Um, I really like this episode because they slowed it down a little bit and you finally kind of get some information on, on Grogu, a.k.a. Baby Yoda, you know what I mean? And, and, and they finally kind of give you a little bit of backstory um, as to so we can place him in a timeline. We knew he was 50 years old already, or it was rumored that he was 50. But we know that he was at the Jedi Temple on Coruscant, and somebody took him away from there um, before Order 66 was, uh, was carried out on him. Um, and, and just kind of getting that information and getting his name and everything. I thought this was a really good episode. Um, this is one of those those things that with Star Wars, where they're gonna they're gonna answer some questions for you. But as with any good show, they ask you a whole a whole bunch more, right? So we've got the fact that they've introduced Grogu here, and now we got to figure out well who took him from the Jedi Temple before Order sixty six, and where has he been, and kind of what what has his life been? And then we got the whole thing with with Ahsoka. And last time we saw her, she was getting ready to go out with Sabine and try to go find Ezra Bridger. And we know Ezra was with Grand Admiral Thrawn, whose name got mentioned in this episode as well. Um, and I can't remember the name of those creatures that jumped on that spaceship with them, but they were kind of like four squids or four octopus, you know, in, in, in space or whatnot. So there's a lot to, to take in here. And I think this show, the scope of this show may end up being bigger than we thought it would be. Uh, you know, with, with Thrawn and then they ask the question, okay, now where's Sabine? Okay, now where's Ezra? And kind of what's going on out here. So I thought this was a really good episode. This episode asked a lot of questions. Um, and I, I think that Dave Filoni and uh, John Favreau have, have put together a really good show here. And I think as far as live action Star Wars and what we need as a Star Wars community, I think this is it. 
Uh, this is one of those shows that I think is really, really knocking it out of the park. So I really enjoyed it, man. Like I said, I, I, I give it a thumbs up. I, you know, out of out of ten, I get this one a nine. Um, and that's just, and I always reserve a ten for something that just blows me away. That's just super, super outstanding. So I give this episode a nine, and I got no complaints. I want to give a shout out to Rosario Dawson for making the soaker come alive, and I think her lightsaber work looked really good. Um, one thing about her lightsaber work that I appreciated was the fact that she looks like somebody who trained under the old way uh, as far as her, her stances and how she was moving and how she was handling the blaster fire. She really does. Uh, as opposed to when you look at Ray and you look at uh, Kylo Ren, their fighting styles are a little bit different. And I'm not knocking them for that. I'm just saying that I, I enjoy the fact that she looks like you know, practitioner of, of one of the older seven forms of, uh, of combat. So I thought it was pretty cool. And you could tell she mixed in a little bit of her own personality in there too. So I thought it was dope, man. So like I said, the episode gets a nine for me. Those are thoughts from Kevin. Um, what do you guys, two of the things that Kevin said, Claire, I'm going to start with you. Um, what do you take from his statements along with your thoughts of the episode as well? I mean, just going off of it, uh, yeah, I definitely going to um, – hi, everybody, by the way. Uh, I would definitely want to mirror my, the, his sentiment that it was really well done, really well cast with uh, with uh, Rosario. The choreography of the lightsabers, the way she dipped in and out of the fog, and the way she used her force powers uh, really intelligently and tactfully, and it wasn't just this overtly insane display of power. That – whole thing was just really well done it was fantastic and like malcolm said there's and like even kevin said there was just no one else who could play ahsoka tano she is perfect per thing it's fantastic grogu the revelation therein and the fact that they revealed his storyline which you know we'll get to that in a little bit um is really really cool the uh the Jedi Temple thing, that was uh, an interesting uh, call-out because that's actually something that's been covered in the comics recently. I think we've gone over it before, uh, talking about how between uh, Luke coming from the Cloud City to uh, his training with Yoda, he actually went on a pilgrimage that we didn't really know about before and found a Jedi Temple and other other masters. So, yeah, it's, it was really interesting that they're reaching to this and trying to tie all this together, uh, not only with the current extended universe, but the comics as well. So, everything that happened in that episode was actually a very major tie-in to several different things, not just in the conversation, but what was revealed through a lot of everything that took place. So, I, I love the episode. I want to watch it again. So, I, think, I am going to watch it and eventually watch it again. Um, mm -hmm. Jeremy, what about you, man? Man, um, I think Clay and Kevin kind of hit the nail on the head. Uh, Rosario Dawson, when I saw her, because let's let's because if you watched our last video, we thought that we were going to get it. You get Ahsoka mm -hmm. on the last episode, but this last one, they hopped straight to straight, it. Straight mm -hmm. into there was yep. no delay. They was like, all right, we we teased you enough. Let's let's get to business. And um, mm -hmm. one thing I was telling Malcolm earlier is that uh, it it had a very Kurosawa storytelling vibe um there's a game out called ghost of tsushima on playstation and it's very close to that style mm -hmm. uh the fighting scenes the 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 grittier ahsoka you know we we grew up watching this spunky ahsoka who was just mm -hmm. ready to rag and tag and fight this one's a little bit more cold yet graceful she's like she's down with a purpose and she will kill you like it it used to be an internal uh, debate within herself? No, not anymore. If you have chosen that pathway, you will be cut down like the rest of them. And she yeah. did that. Uh, from the shorter blades to the one-on-one -on -one fight with the magistrate, and I'm sure we'll get into that. I enjoyed the fact that in the other episodes, when we had these grandest battles, we had the music, we had the sound effects. Here, it was just water, imagery, and prowess. It was just a fight. It was nothing else. It, it, it was kind of like the calm before the storm. And I felt like it was also a reference to Kill Bill um, with the Lucy Law, uh, not Lucy Law, uh, Lucy Lou battle uh, between go. the bride and her when the music stopped and it got to seriousness when there was nothing else, just them in the snow garden just a battle and i got that vibe and, and i loved it i loved it it's i was saying that that previous episode was my favorite nah this one tops it this one tops it yeah easily 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, of course, it's going to be favorite episode for me. Y'all know how much I'm in love with uh, Silver Tunnel. Right. Um, we got married at yesterday. Anyway. <laughs> 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 but not for real, though, man. Like, they went straight into it. And I, I woke up Friday. I was off because I had to travel to, to go be in a wedding. And it was a couple of hours before my haircut appointment or whatnot. And I woke up. I was like, I'm going to go back to sleep. And I was like, oh. I can go sit on the sofa and watch Mandalorian because I know what's going to happen. And I got my blanket and trotted down the hallway and sat on the sofa. And then that first boom came to the camera and I was like, hee hee. <laughs> 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 I was like, here we go. Here we go. Let's do it. <laughs> and my girlfriend said it again and she trying to get my attention. She's doing a little dance. And I'm like, she's like, oh, okay. All right, I see what's going on here. Yes, look, move. <laughs> it's a soccer time. It's a soccer time. That's what matters right now. But um, all of you guys definitely hit it. We're, we're at a position in Star Wars now where everything that the previous iteration of people in charge of Star Wars tried to get rid of is now making its way back. Because one of the things that she said um, in regards to that Jedi Temple was taken to taking them to the planet Tython, which is the original place where the Jedi was um, was created. You mm-hmm. know, the, the 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 art of being a Jedi and where the Force originated at. And that's a mm-hmm. whole nother conversation in itself. Something straight out of the comics where we, if we get, try to get into it, we're going we're gonna to get too deep. But go, go read into Planet Tython. So I, I'm excited to see what happens next with that. Um, Jeremy, looking at the the pace of the episode, um, but going directly into the meat that we got, that we got to eat on about Grogu and where he came from and why he is. Well, not necessarily why he is, but how he got to this point where he is now. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I like the fact that um, him and Ahsoka had that conversation. And we understand why he's so hesitant to use the force because he's afraid he's traumatized. Mm -hmm. So that means he has an understanding of what he is and what occurred. So with that being the thing, it's like he uses it when he really wants to, not when he's told to, if that makes sense, because remember the situation with the cookies, remember the situation with uh, from season one where they were hunting for the egg and they had to take down the beast. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it has to be something that he gets out of it or something that he's doing to protect, you know what I'm saying, the Mandalorian. So I'm liking the fact that we got some backstory to see why he's so reserved, because if I could do it, I'll just do it all the time. You know what I'm saying? Because if you think about it, he could the eggs he was eating, he could have just been, you know, up, 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 but he's reserved. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more of that. Guarantee, man, if I could use the force, I had shit floating around this room right now. <laughs> all the time. All, the time. <laughs> all, all day, every day, man. I, I wouldn't even, life wouldn't even be the same. Clay, same thing to you, man. Look at, looking at that, that, and I, Clay, I want you to touch on the conversation that they had because people who don't watch Star Wars or understand Star Wars will be like, what conversation? I didn't hear him or her talk to each other. They just looked at each other. What are your thoughts on that? Well, okay, so let's talk about the conversation, uh, just that aspect of it before I touch upon any other parts. Um, If you look at other iterations of Star Wars, uh, it's been done before where you have two individuals who are connected via the Force. They can intercommunicate in their own way. It's more of a universal language for them than it is something that's spoken or heard. Um, Some people might even try to liken it to the way cats talk or, you know, other animals talk. They talk on a different harmonic frequency than can a human being hear. Um, To that degree, it's the same thing for Force-sensitive individuals versus non-Force-sensitive individuals. Uh, Force-sensitive individuals can hear that kind of conversation between two people, especially if they know how to tap into it. And given that Grogu is a yodeling, as I'll continue to say, um, or a yaddling or whatever you want to use, um, (laughs) there's so many other names. Uh, (laughs) Given he is what he is, uh, he's naturally in tune to it. And given where he's from, uh, in terms of where he was in his youth, because he's he's at least 
50 plus when you consider the timeline from where he comes from um so you come coming from that point and his training with the force and he yeah of course he's force sensitive of course he's force attuned and he probably knows how to use that level of communication um more than probably of course he used it with ahsoka so that's really kind of what it boils down to the reason why we didn't get the meat and bear the meat of that conversation except for what ahsoka outlined was because the entirety of the conversation was had in a different fashion they don't want to go back into that so that whatever we we know the gist of it we know his story i'm sure it'll flesh out more over time um but going to what jeremy had said about the reason he uses it that he's something that he gets out of it or something that perhaps he's even comfortable with uh just mirror that to what ahsoka had done by trying to force him to levitate the rock back to her and then he wouldn't have anything of it but then here comes mando and he pulls out the little shiny toy and he's like yeah that so not only do we again see that father-son familial uh connection between mando and grogu but we also see that like jeremy had said this is something that he wanted this is something that he was comfortable with using his powers to obtain and so he gets slips back into that comfort zone and is able to use his powers there as well um and he's used it almost instinctively before with trying to stop uh, the uh, the horned beast and uh, this, that, and the other. So it's it's really cool uh, where they're going with that. Absolutely. Um, I, I look at it from a sense of so much of the, the knowledge that was dropped just in that little two or three minute scene, um, looking at what we know about the Force, looking at what we know about the story of Order 66, and makes you wonder who got him out. I was watching a video the other day. They said, what if it was the Jedi librarian? What if it was her? What if she was the one that got him out? They, somebody said, what if Yaddle got him out? What if Mace Windu got him out? Who, who, it was so many different options and thought processes of who could have been the person you have to look at everything that was going on at that time during order 66 at the jedi temple mm -hmm. it's it is so widespread out of what could have happened or was he gotten out way before that when somebody when it, and another thing somebody touched on was and i think it, it, it was a to me it was a reach it was like but um, looking at Yoda when he felt Order 66 taking on uh, going on and one of the moments where he looked like he was just in immense sorrow what if he was thinking about Grogu and I was like okay yeah but you know that, that wasn't even a thought back then but you know you know, but we live in a world now where we can say that a little boy that looked up in Iron Man that was that was Peter Parker mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying so it, 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 it just maps it out and fleshes it out so far and so wide that it becomes so narrow so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, looking at Order 66 and looking at the fact that we now know that Grogu played a part in it. Clay, what are your thoughts on that? Like, how, how so? Um, played a part in as he was there. Okay. He was at the Jedi Temple. Right, right. Um, so as far as you know, like like what you were talking about with them getting him out of there, what, you know who was behind that, who, who orchestrated that. There's a lot of uh, characters in Star Wars lore that have been uh, retconned and uh, you know crossed out as canon. So um, there's a possibility they could have created a character similar to that. I'm sure, like I said, I'm sure that'll flesh out over time. Um, obviously, Order sixty six failed to get rid of all the Jedi. You know, again, there are others out there, even between episodes five and six, um, which came way later. So, but that is a good idea, or that is a good point. That is a possibility that a Jedi that may have had some level of foresight um, had seen the events coming up to it and knew that Grogu may play an important part in later events, which they're obviously trying to tie to given uh, the cloning facility we saw in the previous episode. So uh, that's a very strong possibility. Same thing for you, Jeff. Uh, I, I hate to recap this, but he's exactly right. Um, it, with so many things becoming canon now, 
I'm just excited to see how it came to be. Like, I, I don't even want to speculate. I want to sit back and allow them time and space to kind of surprise me. Um, we, we talked about so many nods and of course we like to go back and see, you know, who's in the seasons and things to be. And we've, you know, we've also hinted on characters being uh, integrated. And the one thing that kind of stood out to me, and, and this is kind of something we'll touch on later, is something I forgot that occurred in Rebels was that um, the 501st had collaborated with General Thawne before. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I'm like, and Malcolm, you and I talked about this too, that uh, there is a casted, uh, casted actor who hasn't been um, revealed yet. And we looked at his picture and he looks strikingly similar to someone we've seen before who we haven't heard from, you know what I'm saying? So I just, as much as I want to speculate on who did what, I'm glad it happened, but it lets me know that they are officially tying, okay, 501st executed 66. Mm -hmm. We know he was there, you know what I'm saying, on Coruscant, but we also know that 501st worked with Thawne. We heard Thawne name said before, it's official, it's happening, it's happening. They're like, we heard y'all, we're tying it, so... Come on, man. Come on, Ezra. We waiting on you, bro. <laughs> we waiting on you, bro. We man, waiting it, on you. It just blows my mind that we are about to be in reality where we're going to see throwing live action. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and the question is, how? Who, what, when, where, why, and how? And we have to ask the how because we have to we need what we need to know. Where is this in the timeline? Because again, if, if we're there at a position where we're continuing directly after the events of Rebels with a Soka store, or we're somewhere in the midst of that before it takes place. Mm -hmm. But at the at the same time, it's also like that can't be because Theron was in this position where he was trying to rule and take take over mm -hmm. and do all these things. But it could still be there as well. And, and it's just it's a lot. It's a lot to process. It's a lot to put together. What are you guys' final thoughts? I'm ready to see Sloan, too. Let me say that. Mm. I'm ready to see Sloan, too. I forgot about her. Um, she was one of my, uh, like, slept-on villains that I really messed with. I liked how cold she was. Don't get me wrong. Thrawn is the king of, of cold and calculated, but I liked how emotionless she was. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Absolutely. Let's go That's villains. As far as this episode was concerned, um, immediately excitement because uh, of what I'm doing with Diablo right now. And they threw the name Corvus out, planning Corvus. And that's mm. that's a name in Diablo lore, and I kind of geeked out a little bit. Uh, but with aside from that, um, when we're talking about uh, everything that happened, it was so beautifully done. Um, I, I really got to give it to the director. The, the whole episode was just fantastic. And everything they're doing is tremendous. Sloan, sure. Thrawn, okay. But show me some more of my boy. You know what I'm saying? Can't remember mm. his name right now. Hang on. Moff Gideon. Oh, there it is. M-O-F-F. <laughs> M-O-F-F. Yeah, okay. That spells Moff. Uh, <laughs> okay. Them working together, bro, is going to be an issue. Bro, people would die immediately. Yeah. People are going to die, bro. We said this last time. <laughs> people are fit to die, bro. <laughs> Throwing it and and Moff get man, look here. I think they would butt heads though at the same time. Yes, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So it would just have to be a, a an agreement of all right, we're here to destroy people. You know what? We'll both agree with that. Let's do it. <laughs> you know, that's that's really what it would be. It would be it. Ooh, but you want to talk about the battle lines in terms of loyalty is concerned. Like we mentioned before, we when my dude literally took a suicide pill for Moff Gideon. Yeah. And who like people that have that kind of loyalty, and you want to talk about who has the loyalty to people like Thrawn and people like Gideon and people like yeah, yeah. Oh, that makes me tingle just thinking about it. Definitely, definitely. Well, guys, this has been another episode of Inside the Razor Crest. We thank you for joining us and watching. We'll be back next week with reviewing the newest episode of Mandalorian. I hope you guys will tune in for it. You can always find us on our uh, respective pages, the 2020 Podcast LLC. And Tales of the Blade, and of course, here at Phantom Anonymous. We will see you guys next week. Peace. Take care.